So uh, welcome. This is our Black History Month celebration. Uh, some people say we got it in just in the nick of time. I say we got it in, all right? <laughs> and the congressman picked this date, and so we wanted to honor that. Uh, I'll let uh, Vicki introduce the congressman, and then Vicki will ask a few questions, and then we'll, then we'll have it open up to the audience. So let me just say Dr. Uh, De Francesco Soto. You may have seen her on TV. She's on MSNBC a lot. What other program? You're on a lot of programs. I, I can only do, or in Telemundo, if you're watching Telemundo. Telemundo, si. Uh, Vicky. En Espanol. Vicky's a, prof, a pro, hey, excuse me. Uh, Vicky's a <laughs> professor at the uh, LBJ School, and she's recently re been named the Director of Civic Engagement for the school. And actually, just today, she launched the diversity and inclusion website at the school. So a lot going on. So I am, without further ado, Vicki, why don't you start speaking? And not so much about Philadelphia, all right? All right, no Philadelphia here. First off, Tom and Robin, thank you for inviting us into the LBJ DC home. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I am the newly appointed Director of Civic Engagement. And what does this mean? It literally means engaging and bridging. So the, the town gown divide, what we're doing inside the classrooms, making it more relevant to what is happening here in DC in the Austin local community in Texas. And so when I started thinking about programming, about engagement programming, um, Tom and I were talking. I said, well, I wanna do something uh, in February commemorating Black History Month loosely, but really bringing in voices that engage. So. If you were paying attention during the midterm elections, you know that Representative Allard was at the forefront of that. His camp campaign was based on bridging, you know, having taken um, a seat, a Pete Sessions seat that had one very particular ideological flavor that wasn't about bridging necessarily. And the representative came in and said, we need to talk regardless if you're R or D, black, white, brown, we need to engage, we need to come together. So. Um, you came to me, I said, we've got to do this. Uh, it was a cold call. I just literally looked up your office and called up the office and said, hi, we'd really like to have the representative come and talk. And here we have them. Um, the other thing I want to say before I turn it over to the congressman is uh, I was having lunch recently with, a, with an old friend of mine who's a political hand in Texas, right? He has his finger on the pulse. And I told him that we were hosting Representative Allred, and he said, he's a supernova. I said, what? He said, he is amazing. He's modest. He's humble. You may not see that. He doesn't have the flash. But you're likely looking at the next speaker. He then went on to tell me that, which I didn't know, that you had the largest or one of the largest ground campaigns in the midterm election. So a reporter was calling this friend of mine, Manny, and he said, uh, hey, can you, can you tell me about the Beto effect in Texas? And Manny said, no, actually, let me tell you about the Allred effect. Because all of these House and Senate seats that we saw flip in the Texas legislature we're in no small part due to this man sitting right here. So when we hear about Texas turning blue or Texas turning purple, you know, it, it doesn't just happen. It happens because we have people on the ground who are coordinating these very strong ground games. So with that, I wanted to um, welcome you, Representative, and, um, and going back to the election. What made you run? What, what was maybe that one moment that you said, I'm gonna take on Pete Sessions? Yeah. Well, so first of all, I think it's important, um, especially in Texas, we, we really care about this, uh, that people run where they have a connection. Mm -hmm. All right, so I wasn't you know, throwing a dart at the board and saying, what's a competitive seat that I can win? Mm -hmm. I was literally born and raised in my district, right? And so that kind of informed how I felt about it. And I thought um, that the way we were being represented was really out of step with the, the area that I knew. And so um, you know, I was in the Obama administration. I was at Department of Housing and Urban Development, Secretary Castro, uh, and I was also responsible for part of the transition from our administration to the Trump administration. I literally closed the door uh, at HUD. And uh, you know, during that time, I saw that I didn't think they were taking their incoming responsibilities very seriously. Mm -hmm. And I thought, you know, this was going to be a time, you know, it's going to be hard for the country, that we're going to have to have a reaction. 
and there's only one place that I would run the four hours from. So that was kind of where I feel going to get in. What do you see as the biggest challenge, um, both for your district and for the state of Texas? Well, I mean, there's, I think there's two avenues where there's political and, and uh, policy, and they're somewhat connected because I think politically we have to increase and do so much more to get more, to get, raise our voter turnout, get more people involved in our politics. You mentioned our, our ground game. Our, our effort was basically just to try and turn out electors that, that looked like our district uh, because that just hadn't been able to happen. It's actually a pretty diverse district, a diverse area. Uh, we wanted to make sure that the people who are voting reflected that. Uh, but we have set up a number of barriers in Texas. And we have also a culture, generally speaking, that has kind of, uh, over the last four decades, been one that didn't encourage civic participation. It didn't have really high voter turnout. We were 49th or 50th in voter mm -hmm. turnout in most elections. Mm -hmm. uh, and we were really having uh, such a small turnout that it resulted in producing extreme politicians because you have a small primary turnout that is the most extreme version of that party and then you have a small general election turnout that, that, that extremist wins and they get empowered to do some things that are really hurting the state uh, and holding us back. Um, so that's that's kind of I think our, our political and civic challenge is to increase voter turnout and to make sure that as we continue uh, to diversify we're a disproportionately young state, yes. we're a very diverse state, we need to make sure those young folks who are coming up know that this is their democracy, this is their government. President Obama used to always say, you know, government is not them, it's it's us. Mm -hmm. You know, like, it's not some distant thing, you know, and those of us who work in it, we understand that. The people who are in there make decisions and just people, you know, I mean, and you can change who's in those positions or make different decisions, but it's it's not something that you can't touch, it's just your government. Um, we, we worked very hard in the campaign to communicate that to people and we're trying to use you now my congressional office mm -hmm. uh, to be as accessible as possible and to be in places where maybe Congress hasn't been before in my district. Um, and so I think that, that that's our biggest challenge going forward. Well, and I think so, you, you touched on the demographic piece of it. You know, uh, for the political scientists in the room, we know that young people just don't vote. They, they don't, they have better things to do than vote. Um, we know that lower SES folks, uh, black and brown folks don't tend to vote as much, but also there are these institutional barriers that are pressing down upon us in Texas. I mean, just recently we saw that the Secretary of State was trying to purge these voter lists. So it almost feels like we're swimming up against the, the stream, but, but you were able to really make some very significant <laughs> headway. Uh, I, I wanna focus a little bit on the youth vote because you are young. You were probably in, you know, one of the youngest members in Congress, and I think I, I want to hear about how younger folks were relating to you when you were on the campaign trail. Do you feel that that was something that also helped in mobilizing folks aside from seeing someone who's just in their 60s, 70s, or 80s yeah. representing them? Yeah. Well, we so from the very beginning, I said I want young people to not only vote for me but beyond the campaign. So we had a fellows program. Uh, mm -hmm. We took high school and college kids and uh, just brought them into the campaign, taught them everything there was uh, in campaigning, which was really just you know, hard work, you know, um, knocking on doors, uh, you know, doing things in the, in the summer when nobody was watching. It was really hard to do that, but that would prepare you for the fall. Uh, and so we had, you know, I think over 200 kids who were on that program, mm -hmm. and that's a lot for a congressional campaign. I mean, we had so much, so many people come through that we couldn't fit them all in our office, and. I really think that the most effective tool for talking to young people, we're talking about young people in their early 20s, mm -hmm. their current 18s, like that, it's other young people. Uh, and and you know, it's, it's effective, of course, to have a young candidate, and I think that's part of why they got involved. Uh, but it's also that we didn't just give them you know, nothing to do, but we gave them real responsibility. We showed them that campaigning is not some uh, secret uh, that you can't learn if you get to a certain age. And all it is, it's just hard work. You know, you're willing to work hard, willing to, Spend the time if you're okay with talking to your neighbors and to your friends and having some, sometimes difficult conversations, but important ones uh, that you can campaign, and that's all it is. There's no secret, there's no, there should be no locked doors. Um, I, I feel very strongly that we have to grow open the doors to our government mm -hmm. and also the process of getting into government uh, because when people see that, I think they recognize, oh, well, I could do this too. And a number of my uh, folks who are on the campaign are considering running for their own offices now or running other campaigns now, and 
and that was my goal was to try and build something that would have some seed yeah. and some uh, seedling to, to spread out. Hence the Alred effect that my friend was talking about. He's like, well, this is this is what we're we're um, focusing on. Uh, let me turn to the the issue of bridge building because your, your, your district is a mixed district and, and, and you're now serving in an institution that's mixed. The, the Republicans have the majority in the Senate and the D's in, in the House. So talk to me about what you're seeing as, as points where bridges can be built or are being built, but sometimes we don't see it because the code hearings are going on. Yeah, yeah. Well, you know, there are a lot of pressures here in this town um, to not build bridges and that's, um, a shame. It was a almost perpetual campaign. And even as soon as you win, it's, you know, re-election and all that. And, and uh, oh, I don't want to work with that person if they're trying to win their seat. And that does make it difficult to govern. Um, but so far, and I think the stat is so accurate, 70% of my votes have been bipartisan. Right? And so you never know that reading the news or, or watching TV. You never know that we agree 70% of the time. Um, and uh, in our Committee work. I'm on the transportation infrastructure committee. I'm on the foreign affairs committee and the veterans affairs committee. All three of those are pretty bipartisan committees, and, I, and I'm somebody who believes strongly in kind of the 80 20 rule. That we're going to agree largely on 80 percent of things across party lines, and we'll disagree and sometimes vehemently on the 20 percent. But that we need to spend as much time as possible on that 80 percent because there are a lot of things going on in the country. And one of the things I've been frustrated with as I entered this institution under shutdown. It lasted as the longest shutdown in government history, um, was that it was such a single issue thing. And we're not a single issue country, mm -hmm. and we can't be. You know, uh, we are facing a global competition, uh, and I thought it was very a juxtaposition of the Chinese landing a rover on the far side of the moon while we were having a debate over mm -hmm. whether or not open the government over building a barrier on the, on the border. Mm -hmm. That juxtaposition to me showed that we're, we are not having the right conversations in our country. Uh, and I do think there's a lot that we agree on, and I've seen that. And it's, you know, I think we're going to get some things done, actually, even in this Congress. And, you know, probably be around infrastructure, uh, prescription drugs, uh, job training, things like that. Uh, and I think that's what the American people expect us to do. Um, but you know, I, I, I don't blame the American people for this. I actually think we were led into this. I think we had uh, generations of politicians and strategists and people who tried to find every web issue they could mm -hmm. to hit us against each other. And we have had um, not enough consistent leadership that tried to bring us together. I do think President Obama tried to do that. Uh, and I'm hopeful that our, whoever our nominee is in 2020, and I am a Lula and Castro fan, um, that whoever our nominee is, that, that they are somebody who tries to bridge those gaps and bring people together and not focus so much on the differences, since there is a lot that we agree on. So I'm going to ask one more question, and then I'll open it up to the audience. But um, because you were on the ground, in Texas, you know, for what, 18 months or more. Can you tell me about um, where you see the state going? Yeah. Well, it does, it does depend on, on, on the direction that we take in 2020. Yeah. Um, if we have the right nominee, I can very well see Texas flipping. Um, in 2020? In 2020. Wow. And I think that there was a report came out yesterday or today that pretty much showed that. Mm, that the Quinnipiac, yeah. yeah. And you know, I, one of my constituents is President Bush, and I had a, a meeting with him. We had a great meeting. We talked for about an hour. Um, I was I grew up a huge baseball fan in Dallas. He was the part owner of the of Texas Rangers, so we could we could go back and forth all day on baseball. And, all that. and you know, one of the things that we talked about uh, was that this brand uh, of the Republican Party that President Trump has led them into is is toxic. For we are a state that uh, it has always been a large, diverse state. We don't believe in demonizing people. And I remember when President Bush used to give speeches in Spanish. Uh, and he got a significant percentage of Latino voters. Mm -hmm. uh, and that didn't demonize. Uh, you know, I remember after 9 11, even with all the pressure that was there, uh, when he said that we're not at war with Islam, you know, we are at war with uh, the terrorists who attacked us. That was an important distinction. You know, that's one that I think Texans believe in. Mm -hmm. We're a state that has been very, very much benefited by trade and our global relationships. Where obviously we share a huge border with Mexico. Mm -hmm. um, these are all things that are kind of counter to what President Trump has been doing, and that's 
why it's kind of forward, I think, some gasoline on what was already going to happen in Texas in terms of our, our changing uh, electorate. So um, again, it does come come down to the site when and turnout. We're going to have to make sure we do that, that we have uh, you know, effort across up and down the ballot in 2020 mm -hmm. to turn out the votes. Um, because for us in Texas, if we have an electorate that is reflective of our diversity and our youth and all that, uh, then it, it will go to a candidate that has the strongest appeal there. That could be a Republican if they put up the right person. Uh, but of course, I think in this, uh, 2020, it likely would be a Democrat. One last question. Who's going to challenge Cornyn? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's a good question. It's I the crystal know. ball question. It is. It is. And I don't know. I mean, uh, I, I have some folks who I think would be good candidates in mind. I don't want to put any pressure on them. I'm certainly not going to do it. Uh, you know, I'm really focused on my district. I think it's incredibly awesome to represent my district. Um, you know, I think that uh, you need to have strong candidates at every single mm -hmm. level. All right. We'll be back in 2021. And before I open it up, let me introduce our associate dean, Kate Weaver. Kate makes, Kate is the behind the scenes person that just makes it all happen. She um, is our dean of students, so is really the point person for everything having to do with our LBJ students, both here and in DC. So, um, question, conversation. Is this for this? Am I loud enough for this? <laughs> oh, okay. All right. Th uh, thank you for coming. Congratulations on the baby. Congratulations on your win. Uh, two questions. First question, uh, which did, experience did you enjoy more, HUD or the White House? I, I'm an alum of both, so I wanted to find out. I'm a former Deputy Assistant Secretary over at HUD, so yeah. listening to, to your experience and looking at So which did you enjoy more? Well, so uh, when I was at the White House, I was a, an intern with the council's office, uh, and I did enjoy the, the council's office to see the full range of the agency, but at HUD, we did more focus work, and I enjoyed that part of the work. Dive into that, and I think it's a little bit, HUD is an agency, as you know, where the rubber meets the road, and there are people who decide, if we don't do our work, they're not going to be back to do work today. So it's a, even though it's been a bit of a political football and sort of packed a lot, I think it's a really important agency that we should remind people to tweak a lot better. Thank you. And my second question is, so you alluded to it and we've talked about it, um, Texas turning blue, uh, Texas being purple, the Texans, Texas seems to vote red pretty substantially, except in those few districts that are in the, you know, urban areas and the suburbs and the exurbs, which is what we just saw. Is it really gonna turn blue? I mean, that's, that's a real question. Is it really gonna turn blue? Or are we, just, are we just dreaming that same dream that we've been dreaming for 20 years? state where we improved the most from 2012 to 2015 is Texas. I just want to be clear, Texas won. Uh, so when Hillary Clinton lost Texas by nine points without putting any money there, there was no effort there. And if you look at 2018, you can say, well, Beto lost by two points. That's a, I mean, that's a pretty close race, obviously. And I think in 2020, if we have the right candidates, do the right work, uh, make the right appeal, that there's no reason why it could not go blue. It just it will depend on how what our state level candidates are and how they run in Texas. I don't know. I'm probably going to be in Texas. Not so much about that, but the congressman's chief of staff, who is also his campaign manager, is here. So some of those questions might be for her. Are you able to stay or do we have to continue this conversation? I'll be able to stay. So I have a, a, a small question. What's your opinion of the Voter Rights Advancement Act that uh, Rep. Sewell just introduced this week, yeah. particularly since Texas would be subject to preclearance? Well, I'm a co-sponsor on it, so uh, they clearly support it. Um, and, you know, listen, what we needed for a while, 
I'm a voting rights attorney. I can talk about that in the court. But we did for a while what the updates do in that formula that we need for what states and municipalities should be under the Kentucky Human Rights Act, right? That should have happened for a while because there were states that weren't under that who were very bad actors. Mm -hmm. uh, in fact, I was part of a, a lawsuit in Wisconsin uh, where we passed a lot of laws that were very similar to what we have in Texas with voter registration restrictions on voting rights, uh, restrictions on voter registration that were very draconian. And that wasn't constitutionally under the previous provision. So, you know, we probably should have updated it uh, before the Supreme Court struck down that formula. Um, and now there's no constitutional reason why we have this formula and why it shouldn't expand judicial review. And, um, you know, if we want to get on, out from under preclearance as a state in Texas, then we have to stop passing laws and taking actions that we want to do. And if we do that, we'll get out from under it. It's just that simple, right? So if we become a pro-voting state, well, that would be real easy. Um, and listen, voting, it's funny, it's, it's become a partisan issue, but it's not partisan. You can vote for anybody, right? Um, and it shouldn't be in Texas. Uh, it sh we should want as many people as possible. Uh, and make your appeal and see where the chips fall. You know? um, but that's, you know, we need to restore the vehicle for that, the Voting Rights Act. It's, it's clearly seen that there are still ongoing efforts to suppress or restrict the vote across the country. And this is also, I'm on the Foreign Affairs Committee, I have to be honest with you, it's, we need to, as a country, continue to be the country that stands up for the role of democracy in the world. In a time when we're increasingly seeing autocratic regimes on the rise, uh, we need to be the, the country that is a shining beacon. And part of that is having fair voting laws. Dean Weaver. Dean Weaver. <laughs> I wish they had stopped calling me that. Uh, I just want to repeat one thing that Vicki said is I'm really inspired by the way you've engaged youth in your campaign. And I say that not just as a professor who saw a lot of my students very excited about your campaign, but I'm also a mother of a 15 year old who up to this point was relatively unaware of politics. And we chose your campaign to follow. And as a result, she has a, has a renewed optimism and a real excitement about politics, so thank you on a personal level. My question is actually about the events of the week. I promise not to ask about that thing, but what I'm really curious about is um, the House passing the universal background check. And I know this is a very hot button issue in Texas, so I'm very curious about how you talk to your constituents about this issue, and I'm also wondering about what you think we're gonna, is gonna happen in the Senate. Talked about universal background checks in my campaign. I said I was going to vote for this. It came up. It came on board. I voted for it. I was the sponsor on it. I'm proud of that. Um, and I, it actually passed a bipartisan support. And it is a, I think, common sense step. I've seen it's a 90 percent universal background check. Uh, it's, I think, you know, it's a restriction on the Second Amendment. It's totally consistent with the Second Amendment. Uh, and I, you know, and I want to be. I grew up going to camps where we had we had rifle ranges, so that was part of like going to camps where we shot at people with firearms. I'm certainly not anti. Uh, I'm pro making sure that people shouldn't have guns. Don't have them. Uh, and I think this is just a common sense step, and I think that's why we have bipartisan support for the bill. Uh, I'm less optimistic about its chances in the Senate. You know, just there is that 60 vote threshold. That doesn't mean that it's not still important that we take action. It had been over eight years since the House of Representatives had a vote on this bill. And I'm, I'm hopeful that at some point that will be the case. I think we take two more questions. So, in the spirit of the VRA and in commemorating Black History Month, I know that. It's a special challenge as a as a member of of the community uh, of the CBC and and more broadly to really inspire the Black youth vote and Black constituents to continue to sustain the engagement that you all so eloquently talked about the ground game the fellowships around the campaign but how do you sustain that activism so that that spirit of advocacy continues so that it's not um, 
just a one hit wonder, but you're inspiring, you know, sustained action and activism. We, we actually we had a very big increase in African American growth in my district, and that was on purpose. You know, it wasn't accidental. We targeted it. We worked very hard on it. Um, and I think part of it is living up to the things we said we're going to make and continuing that relationship. I think far too often um, we have campaigns that come to a black community and say, "We need your votes. We need your votes." Yeah. And we don't see you again for two years. Uh, you know, I had a African American roundtable last weekend. Maintaining those relationships, we're going to continue to be. I will be present and I will be accessible and I will be doing the things we talked about. And then I'm, I'm confident that that relationship will continue and that we'll still see this as an activism. Um, I'm, I'm very proud that I think statewide, in Texas, the African American vote is at a pretty high rate. Uh, and I think that, you know, we in many ways have been the backbone of the Democratic Party uh, for some time now, especially black women. Um, and so part of that is, is keeping uh, that fidelity. Not just being a drop-in member or a drop-in representative, uh, and you don't have to be black to do that. Right. You know, you can uh, be from you know, any background. I would, you know, throw in there uh, the Latino community and other communities as well. I mean, this, is, this shouldn't just be an electoral bargain. You know, it needs to be an ongoing relationship. Last question. Last question. Do you want to ask it? This is kind of inside baseball. This question has to do with motion to recommit. You know, LBJ was a real uh, process guy. And he's also uh, cared a lot about housing. So I just want to first commend you for all your public service, particularly in that area. Because, you know, even as, right till 68, you know, the housing bill uh, you know, was, was uh, passionate about it. But, um, you know, for moderate members like yourself, you know, these motions to recommit are probably a, a challenge sometimes, but there's an ongoing uh, debate uh, with the House Democrats on it. And I know today there was a, a big caucus meeting on it. Can you shed any light on that? Because those of us who follow politics and have followed politics um, would, would like to learn more about it and kind of how what you think the solution or the answer, if there is one, uh, could be. often these, these motions recommit are just to kind of slow down or affect the underlying legislation to a certain extent. So they're not going to actually vote for what's been actually passed in the bill. And I will say this, I don't think 10 minutes is enough to consider uh, as an initial period because that motion has a large and far reaching implication. I don't think it's a I don't think it's what my position is that it's going to be a good thing. Um, so my position has been unless I think that it's a good faith effort All right. With that last question, I'm going to ask all of you to give Representative Allard a round of applause. <laughs> and before we get to the next detectives, we have a little candy for Jordan. Because um, we want to start him early and maybe push him into the Thank you. There's food and drink in the other wing. Thank you, Congressman. Thank you to your chief of staff. His name I'm forgetting. Hey, hey, hey. I'm sorry. Uh, and we hope to have you back. Yeah, and maybe we'll have another Congressman and we'll do that bridge building. That's good. Yeah. Okay.